Michael Jackson joined the faculty of the Harvard Divinity School this fall from the University of Copenhagen, an anthropologist who has conducted ethnographic research in Sierra Leone and Aboriginal Australia. One of his several books that are, in fact, not mentioned in your brochure is The Politics of Storytelling, Violence, Transgression, and Inner Subjectivity. Michael. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, though I'm a little nervous because I'm the only one who is not a specialist in uh, environmental issues uh, or ethical issues. Um, but I hope that uh, my slice of uh, ethnographic life uh, on Cape York in Australia will, will provide something to think about these major questions uh, through. In October 93, I began ethnographic fieldwork on Southeast Cape York, Australia, with the object of exploring the genealogies and entailments of competing views of the environment held by property developers, eco-activists, and local Aboriginal people. On a brief visit to the region in 1988, I had witnessed confrontations between greens and road makers along the newly bulldozed four-wheel track uh, north of Daintree, a uh, famous Australian rainforest, uh, preserved rainforest area, and I was well aware of the dismay among conservationists when Kukuyananji, the local Aboriginal people, argued for rather than against the road, claiming a need for better communications between their isolated settlements, even though this might lead to further European incursions into areas used for camping, hunting, and gathering, as well as traditional burial sites and sacred sites. The Greens' consternation reflected their commitment to a pervasive myth of primitive ecological wisdom, as K. Milton calls it, that assumes that Aboriginal people live in harmony with and are closer to nature than modern Europeans. Arguing against this essentially racist notion, as well as its corollary, that if Aboriginal people seem to abet environmental vandalism, it is because they have lost their traditional values. Anthropologist Chris Anderson has pointed out that it was local politics, not nature or culture, that led the most powerful and vocal Kukuyalanji group to welcome the road because it stood to gain material benefits and consolidate its power in the mission settlement of Wujal Wujal through better access to the outside world. In 1993, my wife and I would discover that the local politics, the same local politics, governed Kukuyananji discourse on a proposed native title claim to the Daintree rainforests. However, my emphasis in my talk this morning is not Kukuyananji internal politics as such, but the life world of a politically marginal Kukuyananji family with whom my wife and I and our two-year-old son lived for the year 1993 to 4. As a result of the Queensland government's assimilationist policies, our host family, the Obars, were forcibly moved in 1970 from their traditional land to a Lutheran mission settlement at Wujal on the Bloomfield River. But in 1992, they left the settlement to take up residence on a parcel of their former land that had been purchased for them by the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island Commission. Every afternoon, we would accompany our hosts on expeditions to the nearby beach at Weary Bay or to the Bloomfield River mouth to forage or fish. Unlike my wife, Francine, I lacked the patience for fishing and often preferred to stroll along the beach listening to the wind in the casuarinas, observing the stingrays moving like cloud shadows beneath the waves, or watching container ships inching as slowly as clock hands along the horizon and Torres Strait Island pigeons flying in from the open sea to feed in the rainforest. Entranced by what I experienced as the pristine nature of the, of the place, I commented to Mabel, our host, that it was very beautiful, my remark was immediately rebutted by a very pragmatic set of considerations. This is my boo-boo, my country, Mabel said. And she described the green turtles offshore, the bush yams and mud clams in the scrub, and said that she hoped it would not be long before she and her family would reclaim all their land and live undisturbed by outsiders in their place that was rightfully theirs. 
Mabel's remarks brought home to me the extent to which country for Aboriginal people is a social reality, steeped in memories of births, deaths and marriages, of seasonal movements in search of food, and of the traumatic disruptions of colonial history. But it is not passively being on or in the land that gives the land its vitality and meaning, nor are these qualities the result of contemplation. Rather, it is the vita activa, the process of living and moving with others on the land and drawing one's livelihood from it that charges the landscape with presence. Country embodies the sweat, energy, thought and feelings of those who invest their labor in it, just as a fabricated object becomes charged with the vitality of the person who shapes it. Like the Ionian theorists of nature in the 6th and 7th centuries, Aboriginal people assume the world of nature to be saturated or permeated by mind. The ebb of flow and flow of tides, the fury of storms and earthquakes, leaves buffeted and trees broken by high winds, all testify to the ways in which nature is not only filled with energy and power, but ensouled. Accordingly, relationships between realms that we conventionally, conventionally separate as nature, culture, and the supernatural are all glossed as social relationships governed by the same principles that obtain in interpersonal life. Among the Kukuyalanji, such analogical reasoning means that the ecological zones of sea and inland are also cultural categories, Yalunji of the sea and Nakalji away from the sea, connoting separate moieties whose members have different essences and may be identified by their different smells. This logic also explains why sea and inland things must be kept apart. So one is enjoined not to, to use dugong, turtle or bullock, which are meat, as bait for fishing, but to use only fish bait to catch fish, the others being white fella bait. And don't use saltwater fish to catch freshwater fish, or vice versa, one is told. To infringe any of these cultural rules will cause a flood, an ungovernable overflowing of natural boundaries. Thus one learns that misfortunes that would in one's own life world be dismissed as accidents, or simply as being in the nature of things, actually have social causes. Someone must be responsible for them. Someone must be to blame. The same reasoning explains why natural phenomena are so closely and continually examined for their social implications, as when a shooting star or a kookaburra laughing at first light are said to signal a death. This is not to imply that Aboriginal and Western worldviews um, are absolutely different life worlds that these worldviews seem so incommensurate may be more an artifact of our long-standing habit of exoticizing so-called primitive people than a reflection of any empirical reality, a habit still evident in the tendency of many contemporary philosophers of ecology to excoriate global capitalism by urging a recovery of the allegedly more eco-sensitive, sensuous, reciprocal relationship between humanity and the natural world that pre-modern thought is said to epitomize. All such constructions of the other are deeply flawed. In the first place, they inevitably construct nature as benign and narcissistically invoke experiences of the natural world that are pleasing rather than destructive or discomforting to us. The Kukuyanji notion of storms as the malevolent expression of human ill will, of lightning as retributive justice, and of earthquakes and volcanoes as signs of the earth's outrage call such romanticism into question. In the second place, such constructions gloss over the fact that a sensuous experience of connectedness between people and their environment is never permanent or pervasive, but always occasional, arising in specific social contexts, tied to specific social purposes, and constrained by cultural ideas and ritual codes. 
that Mabel Olbar and McGinty Salt, our hosts, made keen observations of the bay whenever we arrived there to fish, remarking the spoor of a snake in the sand, traces of mullet or herring offshore, the state of the tide, and subtle nuances of the sea, the weather, and the season that entirely escaped my notice was not because they participated in nature, but because they were practiced in that way of life in that place. In this sense, their participation in the place they called their own was no more mystical than the participation of a mechanic, say, in an assemblage of machine parts on which he is working, or a scholar in an engrossing text, or a sculpture in the object she is shaping. For all, so to speak, put themselves into what they do, creating thereby the conditions under which they may experience that sense of fusion between body, self, and object that we tend to talk about in terms of naturalness, sympathy, and attunement. In short, states of consciousness, as Marx repeatedly observed, are tied to our modes of interaction with the world in which we live. Two days into our stay, and after long hours working with McGinty and his brother-in-law Babaji to set up our campsite, I went down to the bay alone, stripped, washed, and scrubbed myself in the sea, then dressed. The beach was deserted, but as I sat in the shade of a pandanus palm thinking back on the day and on the fulfillment I had found clearing our campsite with McGinty and Babaji, an aluminum dinghy came slowly inshore from the open sea. It was Mabel's brothers, Sonny and Oscar, and her brother-in-law, Sam. They had been out to Hope Island hunting green turtles. As they beached the dinghy and drew it up onto the sand, I went down to greet them. The sea sloshed around my ankles and gently jolted the dinghy. Two boys, Philip and Louis, ran down the beach brandishing their fishing spears as Sonny and Sam hauled the biggest tur turtle onto the gunwale of the, of the dinghy and tied a rope around its right flipper. Then, as the old man of the sea appeared to gaze about befuddled, Sam beat its brains out with a sledgehammer. I watched intently as Sonny began to butcher the turtle. We call turtle meat minya, not fish, kuyu, Sam explained. And he told me that great care had to be taken when separating the meat from the carapace, for if the bile is spilled, it contaminates the meat and makes it inedible. In the face of such pragmatism, what place did my own unspoken sentiments have as I watched this beautiful creature so out of its depth, so out of its element, being hacked open before my eyes? And how might one reconcile the great difference between the Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal sensibilities that collect around such an event? For while many eco-conscious Australians regard the green turtle as both a beautiful and endangered species, Kukiyalanji regard its green fat as a delicacy and hunt and eat it with relish. That evening, Sonny disinterred the cooked turtle from the earth oven he had dug at the outstation and the fat we shared around. I ate without much appetite, caught between competing cultural persuasions. As the months uh, wore on, I came to understand how Kukuyanji read their environment. Learning, for instance, that a hammer bird heard in the cold months means that mullet will be plentiful, that bean trees flowering or the wild tamarind ripening mean that scrub hen eggs can be found and that the flesh of the parcel apple turning pink means that the liver of stingrays will also be pink and therefore good to eat, though eating stingrays in the preceding months, October, November, will bring storms. As the wet season approached, I became increasingly fascinated by the family's preoccupation with thunder and lightning. Whereas I saw storms as natural phenomenon, our hosts interpreted them in social terms, they were expressions of human malevolence and of tempestuous states of mind. Thus the phrase Jaramali Bajaku, literally exceedingly stormy, is used of persons who lose self-control when drunk or drugged, while the term Jaramali 
denotes a cyclonic or monsoonal storm, any one of which may embody the ill will of outsiders. Questions of control thus entail allusions to individual psychology, relations with others, and relations with the elements of nature. Put another way, the environment includes social beings, asocial beings, natural species, natural phenomena, and innate natures. In Aboriginal communities, one is often struck by people's extraordinary tolerance of aberrant or unruly behavior. And I was sometimes reminded of my experience among the Koranko of Sierra Leone, where incorrigible individuals would draw such comments as, he came out of the fafe like that, meaning even initiation failed to mend his ways. Or, that is how he is made. Or, he is blameless, he was born with that, tray. But while both Koranko and Kukuyalanji explain dispositions that resist socialization by invoking notions of innateness, there are practical limits to people's tolerance of antisocial behavior, which in both societies is seen as a form of deaf deafness to social values. It was Christmas 1993. The heat and humidity was oppressive. Sweat dripped from my forehead onto the pages of my journal as I wrote about the tension that had built up in our camp, breaking on Boxing Day like a storm, with Sonny in a fist fight with his brother-in-law, his elder sister heaping abuse on his head, another sister throwing a couple of punches for good measure, and then the youngest sister, Gladys, and her husband driving off to Ayton, a nearby town, to get away from it all. As the first thunderstorm of the wet season approached, the sky turned indigo and the wind veered and picked up. There was a rattle of dry leaves and dry leaves falling, for which Koki Yalanji used the word yanja, followed by the crumpling sound of distant thunder, like heavy furniture being moved around in an upstairs room, a sound that also has its own specific idiophone, kubum kubum. Painstakingly, people tracked the course of the storm, discussing where it was coming from and where heading, identifying its sounds, observing its effect on the foliage, comparing it with storms in the past. Indeed, the character of the impending storm was analyzed in the same way that people analyze strangers, trying to read their intentions, second-guess their motives, identify their mood. As this discussion went on, various members of the family made forays into the bush in search of wild grape vines, ironwood bark, and grass tree. Sonny, now sober, applied himself to the business of hand, at hand, burning knotted hanks of grass, ironwood bark, and grass tree outside our camp. As the sweet smell of the grass tree pitch spread across the clearing, I assumed that it was meant to repel mosquitoes. But Sonny told me that the storm would smell the smoke and go away. I later asked McGinty, who was not Kukuyalanji, if he could explain to me how burning grass tree could ward off storms. The idea seemed to both amuse and embarrass him, partly because his own people on Princess Charlotte Bay, uh, well to the north, used a different method of warding off storms, partly because he did not want to give me the impression that he was a superstitious mile or bush person. That evening, as I was helping him put up his tarpaulin and tent at the beach, he joked about the ominous rain clouds hovering over the range. Might rain soon, he said laconically. Better tell that storm to wait up until I get my tent up. At Mabel's sister's house in Ayton, however, the mood was somber. Most of the family had gathered behind closed doors, huddled and anxious as the storm approached. One of the children gave my wife a clue as to why they were so fearful. If you eat things you are not supposed to eat, a storm will come and punish you. Was lightning an agent of retributive justice, seeking out those who might have broken a food or sex taboo or transgressed a sacred site? Such matters are difficult for any anthropologist to divine, for who knows what guilty secrets a person may harbor, and whether these get projected as fears of external retribution. One thing was clear, however, and that was the association of thunderstorms and vengeful outsiders. 
In the 1890s, the ethnographer W.E. Roth reported that in many parts of northern Queensland, thunder and lightning were means of sorcery, but that people sometimes summoned these same forces to drive white settlers from their land. I heard identical stories from my Kukuyalanji friend Harry Shipton in 1993. Many years ago, Harry told me, a white rancher, exasperated by Bama, Aboriginal people, spearing his cattle, rode up to a river encampment and shot a young girl dead. Bent on revenge, the girl's father went to the rancher's place as thunder. The rancher fired shots at the thunder, but his bullets passed harmlessly through the thunder's body. Then, with a single lightning bolt, the thunder speared and killed the rancher. In another of Harry's stories, a certain white man who messed with many Bama girls, getting them pregnant and causing trouble, was sought out by lightning as he was driving his tractor in a cane field. Bang! He did, just like that. The association of storms with sexual desire, jealousy and revenge was further clarified for me by Sonny Obar. One day, I was observing Sonny knotting hanks of grass and stuffing them under some logs of grass tree and ironwood bark before setting fire to them to keep the thunderstorm away. When I asked him to explain, Sonny said, the storm smells the nandia, the grass tree, and goes away. After a lot more questioning, I figured out that the underlying logic here rested on an analogy drawn between one's relations with in-laws who, because of the rule of exogamy, are comparative strangers, and one's relations with thunderstorms that also come from elsewhere. The key terms and the relationships between them may be posited thus, mother-in-law is to son-in-law as thunderstorm is to grass tree. When thunderstorms approach, it is feared that social categories that should be kept apart are coming dangerously close together, oneself and one's enemies, insiders and outsiders, even blacks and whites. This situation is compared to the infringement of the avoidance relation between mother-in-law and son-in-law, and by association, any transgression of things that should be kept apart, such as people and forbidden fruits. The problem, how to drive the thunderstorm away. The solution, activate the analogies alluded to above. The practical action, grass tree logs are burned. The explanation, grass tree, as well as iron tree bark and wild grape vine, is son-in-law to the thunderstorm. The thunderstorm will smell the grass tree smoke. And just as mother-in-law will avoid her son-in-law if she smells him, so the storm will move away when it gets wind of its son-in-law, the grass tree. This brief excursion into Kukuyalanji ethnography enables us to see, I hope, that the wild powers that we call nature are metaphorically fused with environmental forces that we call social and political. The world of white fellows and the Australian state, the world of cultural outsiders and of affines. These external environments offer a wealth of possibilities for improving one's standard of living, imported commodities, social services, government grants, family networks, and even outsiders like anthropologists with useful expertise. But gaining access to such life-enhancing resources involves dealing with strangers that one can never really understand, trust, or control, and the external environment remains a mixed blessing, a place of both positive potentiality and invisible danger. With the outcome of the Kukuyalanji land claim still pending, um, something on which my wife and I worked, one cannot predict whether Kukuyalanji will win back their rights to manage their traditional rainforest and coastal environments, or whether this repossession will involve any rapprochement with green, state, or corporate interests. But it is per perhaps worth reminding ourselves that there is no landscape no ocean, and now no sky that has not been changed irrevocably by the work of human hands and the human imagination. When James Cook sailed along the coast of southeast Cape York in June 1770, after his ship the Endeavour had been holed on the barrier reef, and his crew did not know whether they would ever see their homes or loved ones again, 
he observed unforested hills where now there is rainforest that we assume to be primeval and virgin. It is hard to know how the landscape will judge us years hence. We who hold such radically different views of it, each one of which seems imperatively true to the believer who is certain he or she knows what things were like in the past, what the future will bring, and who deserves to inherit the earth. Thank you. Have you developed any sense of a, a post-scientific empathy with nature, where these the the superstitions don't collide with the rationalistic analysis, but there's some harmonious empathy, nevertheless. Nevertheless, that seems to be what we're seeking here. Well, you, you may have uh, gathered that I, uh, I, I want to sort of bracket out all consideration as to what is scientific and what is not. Uh, when Don was speaking of, uh, of a pragmatist attitude, um, I, I embraced the same point of view. I'm far more interested in seeing what the entailments of a so-called scientific attitude or a so-called unscientific attitude are and judging the consequences um, and uh, rather than seeing the attitude as being essentially one thing or another. <clears throat> A question, the contrast between, I, I, one of the thoughts that came to my mind when you were talking is that what kind of a dialogue are we going to have between Wang Yang Ming and Sonny Albar? Uh, and I'm curious in this regard that uh, we use terms like worldview, for example. Uh, we could talk about a worldview like Wang Yang Ming's worldview, the triad of uh, heaven, earth, and, and, and beings, and so forth. However, uh, that might be unpacked in terms of, uh, say, Mary Evelyn's uh, remarks. Uh, how uh, would you describe the, uh, the way in which the, your ethnographic work, the people that you worked with, in terms of their pragmatic, their relationship between uh, the social world, the natural world, uh, our world, is, is a term like worldview even applicable? Uh, maybe I'll leave the question just at that. Yeah. I mean, a, a distinction, Don, that I've, I've often been attracted to is the one that Hannah Arendt makes between the uh, Vita Contemplativa and the Vita Activa. Um, and um, because we are so deeply rooted, I think, in the first, that, uh, you know, she argues this, that we're, we're, we're not uh, confident in um, exploring the other. If you go into a preliterate society, of course, you find yourself um, in um, the Vita Activa, and you don't see much evidence of people contemplating the meaning of things, standing back in, uh, in moments of leisure and philosophizing, let alone producing uh, a point of view or a philosophy that might endure in print or in some other form. Um, so anthropologists usually say that the worldview is implicit. Um, I'm not even comfortable with that. Um, and uh, when uh, Mary Evelyn was talking, I, I had a question forming in my mind as to the social context in which he lived. Um, and you hinted at this. He lived in, in difficult times. And uh, to what extent um, we can understand this philosophy as perhaps a way of taking refuge in thought in difficult times to what extent it's an idealization that uh, was not meant so much um, as something to be put into practice, but something that people could find consolation in. Uh, yes, I'd, I'd really like to hear the answer. 
Well, <clears throat> the point that I didn't have a chance to draw out is his biography and his influence on others throughout the East Asian world. He's one of the most active, <laughs> right. um, engaged. He, he was fighting the barbarians on the border. Um, you know, he, he was one of the most engaged individuals. And in fact, as I did refer to, um, was an inspiration in Japan for how you form humane government, but also how you um, overthrow it in appropriate times with the Meiji Restoration. Right. Um, so this was not contemplation right. for the sake of contemplation right. by any means. Yeah. That that's the, was the whole point of yeah. what I was suggesting. Yeah. And that resonates with the kind of dilemma that my wife and I found ourselves in here because in a sense anthropologists are often converting what is lived into an object of contemplation and a, and a work of ethnography, you know, lays everything out as I have here um, very, very neatly and coherently as, a, as an implicit point of view. But of course, we were also, you know, deeply involved in the, in the research uh, for the land claim. And in that sense, we were trying to sort of put our knowledge into practice. And this was the principal reason for kind of acquiring it. Um, yes. Uh. <clears throat> Having spent a little time in Australia myself, not doing uh, anthropological work, but a sort of um, personal <coughs> resonance with land, I'm struck with the knowledge that, you know, what these people do is their spiritual practice from our point of view, mm. but from their point of view, they're not divided. They're not divided. Yes. It's like what Mary, you, what you were talking about earlier about being the behavior and all of that is one thing. Mm. So the the loss of the turtle is the food and it is a spiritual rhythm that is ongoing. Yeah. Yeah, this, this does make for difficulties because in a sense we've got to drop a, a lot of our vocabulary in order to sort of comprehend um, another another life world um, and the kind of spiritual material cultural natural these distinctions have got to be abandoned to some extent yes yes well yes. I, I'm a scientist or I think I am and you dismiss the first question fairly curtly and I you know you're talking about radical relativism there are some facts. There are some things that it will destroy this world, uh, whether it's the world of the primitive people or our or the world we live in right now. And I, I, I'd like you to say something about how you deal with the objective situation of the environment and the, the eco, our ecological crisis at this time, rather than. Uh, do you, do, you, do you deal with this sort of issue? Well, like I said at the outset, um, this is not my field, and I, I simply wouldn't um, dare to, uh, to talk to that issue. Um, it would be amateurish and, uh, and ill-informed. Um, all I can do is kind of present, um, as I said, a piece of ethnography that may have some oblique uh, uh, value in... Uh, in the, in the kind of conversations that go on around that issue, but it's not it's not something I have any competence to to, to talk about. Um, let's uh, yes, Michael. Uh, I I really appreciate your talk for many reasons, but I, I wanted to call to mind a couple of essays from the volume called Uncommon Ground by. Uh, William Cronin, fabulous collection done about 10 years ago. And then there are two essays in there, that one of, whom, one of which uh, I think is titled, Are You an Environmentalist or Do You Work for a Living? And it emphasizes the extent to which people who work the land are intimately connected with it and do not regard often what they're doing in the same light as someone who's coming in from the outside. Uh, and it is a reminder of the extent to which uh, often we environmentalists are really uh, removed from, from the land and, and what, what is actually involved in living close to the land and depending on it. And it's, it's not to say that there, it, it is very difficult, it, it should, we should just infuse our thinking about these matters by such considerations. I'm not, I'm not sh sure what conclusions to draw, but without those 
considerations uh, taken into account, we, I think, draw more problematic conclusions. Yeah. And yet you hear a lot of people justifying the kind of more, the more dis experienced distant discourse by saying unless we can stand back and, uh, and acquire the broader view um, and acquire objectivity, scientific or otherwise, then uh, particular interests and particular involvements are going to lead us, you know, like lemmings over the cliff. <coughs> yes. <coughs> It sounded like that there was a stormy season in that area, and so I was just wondering if there was a social aspect to storms that w related to human activity, if people just had bad times during the stormy season, or was it a delayed reaction to arguments that had happened, or things, bad things that had happened earlier on, or was there some correlation between thunder and a stormy season and... Um, well, monsoonal storms are, are like sort of hurricanes in the Gulf. They, they, they bring a lot of... Uh, a lot of destruction in their wake, and people are, are keenly aware of the damage that they, they can do. Um, what interests me, and I haven't gone into much today, is the uh, relationship between uh, thunderstorms and, and in-lawship, um, or relations with, with, uh, with others, other, other tribes, and the more recent relationships with, uh, with settlers, the settler culture, um, which has brought you know, the same kind of destruction um, to Aboriginal people, and the way in which, in a sense, the traditional way of understanding destructive forces from outside has been enlarged to accommodate um, the incursions of co colonial, uh, uh, the colonial state. So you're, you're not saying that a particular th thunderstorm relates to a particular argument or a particular social situa situation. It's a more general. Connection. No, people get very particular. I mean, uh, endless conversations go on about a particular storm, where it's coming from, and what particular um, outsider may, as it were, have uh, deployed it as, 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 a, as a way of kind of doing you harm. Or what... Um, what kind of uh, errors may, may have been uh, committed within the community, people sort of eating the wrong thing or having wrong, wrong way, what they call wrong way sexual relations, um, that this may have actually precipitated the, uh, the, the, the menace. Which they mostly do in the stormy season, it sounds like. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they have other ways of talking about it in the dry season. <laughs> I'm troubled um, about um, the consequence of your remarks uh, <clears throat> in this room. Um, it seems to me uh, m many of us, maybe most of us, will leave the room saying to ourselves, well, those people are really very quaint and quite superstitious. Uh, and uh, aren't we glad that we really know things are quite different than that? Um, you shouldn't be leaving us that way, it seems to me. What should we make of what you just told us? And what do you make of it uh, with reference, let's say, uh, you excused yourself for not being an, an, environment, yeah. an, an environmentalist. But you are a human being on planet Earth, uh, that has to, uh, some way or other, relate to uh, <clears throat> the, the big questions that environmentalists put before us uh, about the future of the next 50 years if we don't do X, Y, and Z. Now, um, wh what do you do with uh, these um, really marvelous reflections presented to us, uh, 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 what do you do to connect that up with this world that most of us are living in? I'm obviously uh, appearing to be dodging questions. <laughs> um, um, I guess I am a, a relativist, um, but uh, I, I probably call myself a skeptic more. Um, 
I simply do not know to what extent um, my way of thinking about an issue is any more or less superstitious, as you said, than these ways. Um, the way human beings um, uh, approach the, the problems of their everyday existence seem to me to be about as rational or irrational in any society. And I simply have never been able to uh, <clears throat> privilege uh, my take on things as being somehow intrinsically more rational or reasonable than any other. And I certainly have never seen any point of view that I inherit uh, from my tradition as having a greater propensity for saving the planet than anybody else's. So this is where I, I hesitate, and that's why I left the, uh, the, the question open at the end of my paper. Michael, thank you.